हेलो हेलो आर यू हेयरिंग मी यू आर ऑडिबल सर यू आर ऑडिबल सर यू कैन प्रोसीड सर या आई विल बी गेटिंग टू द रोबोटिक स्केल व्हिच इज नथिंग बट एन इंडेक्स ऑफ यू नो टेक्निकल ग्रोथ एंड द रीसेंट टेक्नोलॉजी ऑप्टिमाइजेशंस इन ऑटोमेशन रोबोटिक्स साइंस एंड इंजीनियरिंग have brought worldwide quality life and comfortable living these transformations are rapid and the need of the hour is to see them socially relevant appropriate to the mankind it is the right technological vision mindset and research attitude of the scientists over the globe which has revolutionized revolutionized and brought modern trends in robotics and control actually there are lot of developments which happened in the area of robotics and uh, it started in 1956 with automation systems coming up and uh, the uh, father of the you know world uh, robotics world was joseph angel berger who was working with you know the innovation company that time and uh, he started uh, working for general motors later on and later on what happens is uh, it was mark tilden who brought the development of photovolts by utilizing the discarded electronic parts and initiated spy robotics at his tilden's robot world of san diego the growth of robotics is an index of advances in technology and its relevant integration the robotics in true sense involves usage of right human uh, uh, resource and appropriate technology the recent uh, technological transformations in automation robotics science they have brought worldwide quality life and comfortable living these transformations are rapid and the need of the hour is to see them you know socially relevant and appropriate to the mankind is the right technological vision mindset and research attitude of the scientists over the globe which has revolutionized and brought the modern robotics for the human kind see uh, in this lecture basically i'll be coming with thrust areas of uh, re interest and the research and the innovative contributions from the young researchers and this is for the teaching fraternity for sustainable technological progress and development in the area of robotics and control so this lecture mainly deals with modern robotics and has become vital for the mankind in uh, stem that is science technology engineering and math assistance for the societal health and comforts now let me come to the field of robotics uh, robotics can be always it is you know conjuncted with artificial intelligence it is the earlier definition of robotics as per robotic institute of america has been our international robot association has been a robot is a reprogrammable multifunctional manipulator designed to move material parts and specialized devices through variable program motion for variety of tasks so artificial intelligence in robotics efforts to aim at developing machines that appear to exhibit human like behavior such as understanding language learning reasoning solving problems etc what happens is a robot if you th start thinking about it i'll just put up a video clip which you can see here that some of the clips which are actually All 
of you, you know, have seen this, you know, what happens is the robot as such, you have to think about, you know, it's, it's a human-like appearing machine which contains, you know, three systems. A robotic system will be always defined in terms of a recognition system and a mechanical system and it's, it's going to be a control system. So these three subsystems form a robotic system. Anyone which is going to have all these three in a robotic, that, that is going to be called a robot, which you can see here that, you know, uh, if, I, if I start giving a definition of a robot, robot is going to be really a re reprogrammable multifunctional manipulator, which will be always doing task-based commands now as on today. And it will be able to, you know, do commands like look at the workspace, identify the board, determine the location, orientation of the board, pick up the board, etc. But if you think about the history, how this robot world, world coined, it was in 1920, there is a, you know, fiction writer, Karel Kapek, who started writing a drama on Rosam's universal robot, where Rosam was a schoolboy who come across with a scientist in, in while crossing every day on the words, amidst of the words, a scientist who was doing, you know, robot at that time, and that robot was containing all these features, and what happened was the robot in that uh, fiction, the scientist develops the, along with the school boy who every day had interaction, finally, you know, became highly intelligent, it became, uh, you know, emotional, and finally it started devastating acts on the neighboring villages and it killed the scientists. So this was a tragic uh, end from where the word robota started coming. So robota it means it means forced labor in Z word. You know, if you if you start thinking about robotics, the the growth of robotics is going to give the the uh, technological uh, soundness of any country. If you can start seeing here that in 1921 the Karel Kapek started coining the word robot, and in 1956 there are certain milestones which we have to see here that the NC machines and automatic machines started coming up, and in 1970 it was you know the the computers which were started introduced, and there were first generation computers, second generation, and third generation, which you must be knowing that it was all you know semiconductors, then vacuum tubes earlier, and afterwards it is the ICs which have started coming, and now it is embedded systems, and it has gone to, you know, the handheld things wherein you start con con controlling the robots. The robot uh, thing started coming up and driving uh, from 1980s onwards, and uh, it, it, it got a steady moment in the field of uh, uh, the, uh, the industry and what happens is the, the industry started working on three types of robots during that time. One was a robot which was self-learning type uh, which is uh, as of existing today and earlier the first kind of robots has to be you know it was it was a humanoid robot wherein very simple structure like you know information about the task energy source is going to be given and the robot is nothing but a, a simple operational unit and a CPU connected to each other. And here, there is a two-way communication. If it is going to be one way, it, it becomes a very simple open-ended robot and where interactions cannot be there from the workspace. So here what happens is, if a robot is going to see a workspace and start interacting, the measurement and action and... Hello. Yeah. And high-tech sophisticated robot is going to look like this, wherein the information, there are three things which are going to be very, very important. Information about the task, the energy source, and the workspace on which it is going to work. And the robot contains energy source, a computer, and an operational unit. And the operational unit will have an articulated mechanical systems actuators, transmission, and energy sources will also be having, you know, the drives 
which may be in the form of electrical, pneumatic, hydraulic, mechanical, whatever. And if the robot is going to have, you know, a, a kind of working, the, the, uh, it starts, you know, having interaction on the workspace. And if it is going to have an external sensory information, it will be passed on to the computer and there will be commands internally getting onto the articulated mechanical systems and robot starts controlling on itself and the actuators, transmission systems, everything is going to work on a control loop. This is what is going to be the thing. And if you start saying it's uh, uh, in 1974, the Asia introduced all electric motor uh, drive robot and Kawasaki introduced, installed a or filling robot for the motorcycles. And it was in 1976, RCC robot, remote center compliance robot started coming. And 1976, few more robots, programmable universal machine for assembly robots, which are six degrees of freedom, and all this started coming. I'll have to tell you what is degrees of freedom in a robot. In a robot, if you think about in a human hand, if you ask me, if you want to make a, a replica of the human hand, if you start finding out how many degrees of freedom the human hand is going to have, if you think about that, then the each finger is going to have you know three ligaments and there will be three motors which have to be fixed so that these ligaments start acting and once you give you fix up drives at each of these and these drives can be independently controlled so that the constraint relative motion is going to be obtained and the hand starts working as a robot in that case a human hand usually will have you know uh, three into four fingers 12 degrees of freedom plus, you know, a, a finger, if you start seeing my hand here, will be have a, you know, compression motion here, which will grip the object. So that is uh, 13. Then the thumb will have two degrees of freedom, 15. And the lateral motion of the hand for sensing an object is going to be 16. If you start thinking about, you know, 16 degrees of freedom in a robot, what happens is the the kind of drives which are going to be fixed there and the the control which is going to be required it's going to be very very you know complex and the the weight of the hand itself is going to be more than the weight of the robot that's what is going to happen and later on you know you are seeing number of developments which started coming then i was telling you about you know mark tell them some of the robots which are uh, started coming here and which before that let me get into the uh, the a robot. If you start thinking about a robot, how it is going to look like? If you uh, think about a, a recent robot which is installed in hotels for room cleaning and other purposes, it's going to look like this, which doesn't have you know human kind of things. Introducing the iRobot Roomba vacuum cleaning robot. The latest in a line of robots designed to help you maintain cleaner floors. Roomba cleans routinely so you don't have to. In your busy home, floors get dirty every day. Now with the push of a button, iRobot Roomba helps you stay ahead of the mess by cleaning more frequently. Roomba's patented three-stage cleaning system features a powerful vacuum and two counter-rotating brushes. This revolutionary system reaches deep into your carpet to remove an amazing amount of dirt, dust, and pet hair. And unlike an ordinary upright, Roomba cleans the whole floor, under and around furniture and other hard-to-reach areas. It even detects dirtier areas and spends more time cleaning those spots. Its spinning side brush and wall following technology let Roomba clean along wall edges and reach deep into corners. Roomba automatically adjusts its cleaning head to effectively clean both carpets and hard floors. Roomba senses and avoids stairs and won't get stuck on cords or carpet tassels, so you can feel safe letting Roomba clean when you're not around. Roomba features onboard scheduling, so you can tell Roomba to vacuum when it's most convenient whether you're at home or on the go. Roomba also comes with two virtual wall lighthouses that keep Roomba cleaning one room, then guide it to the next so you can be sure that each room is fully clean. At the end of each cleaning cycle, or when its battery is running low, 
Roomba automatically returns to its home base to dock and recharge for the next cleaning. It'll be ready to go the next time you tell it to vacuum. See, you are seeing a robot here which doesn't look like a human being. What happens is the Roomba has three main systems. One is nothing but the motion system, which has, you know, a disc rolling there and the wheels which are going to, you know, carry that. And that's the motion here. And it doesn't look like a human being. And the sensory systems, it will, it will always, you know, sense the dirts, everything. And it starts mopping. Then it starts moving and clean, cleaning. And there is a control system which is going to drive the controllers here. So any robotic system, a robot is going to be called a system when it has three subsystems, motion, control, and the recognition system, which, which you have seen. The other end of that robot, if you start seeing the, the present day robots, which are going to look like this, I'm, I'm just playing a video. There is a robot called as Navo, which is a Japanese robot, which you can see here. Asimo is the country's crowning achievement. Engineers continue to make improvements.
Asimo's most innovative feature is its advanced intelligence. The robot can think and act on its own without human intervention. That's made possible by sensors that replicate our five senses. Asimo's head contains eight microphones. It, it uses them to listen and engage in conversation. Two cameras work as eyes. They can detect humans and use stored data to identify them. No facial recognition problem? No. I don't think so. No, please. Watching animated shows about robots, when running, both feet momentarily leave the ground. Balancing in midair is no easy task. Maintaining posture while jumping or floating in the air was a major technological breakthrough. Asimo leans its upper body slightly forward to maintain overall balance. It goes forward straight, forward straight in the air. Sensors in Asimo's waist measure the robot's angle. It leans slightly to compensate forward or back, side to side. That's how it stays perfectly balanced in the air. Asimo has been evolving ever since development began in 1986, much like a growing child. sketching robot what it is doing is it's sketching the you know facial uh, you know sketch of this uh, artist and it's it's it works like you know a uh, uh, modular uh, motor you know ma machine which you can see here and it's a very very common robot which will be available for artists and you can see here that the image is being built up it is going to be sensed the face facial expression and does. That is the final thing, and there are uh, robots which are going to be imitated by the, you know, the animals which are going to be there. This is the Boston Dynamics robot, which will be. Going to and fro, which you can see here. in the forest, the terrain is going to be most complicated one. He starts doing the obstacle avoidance most very closely. And uh, I just want to give another robot which is going to be called as Actroid, which I'll come to the back. I'll come later on. And uh, there are going to be certain robots which uh, uh, work in the assembly section, which you can see here. And they work on the principle of cooperative manipulation which can be seen now. So here is an extremely complicated operation wherein object starts moving, both the robots you know, start coordinating in such a way that the exact uh, sketching on that object is going to be done with a compliance which will be controlled in future. And uh, the, the robots
starts having lots of you know shapes and sizes and you will not be able to identify whether and say whether nc machine is a robot or not if you start thinking about you know robots which are going to be like uh, this is a tech talk very famous talk which is I'm here today to talk about autonomous flying beach balls. No, as I was saying, you're robots like this one. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the challenges in building these and some of the terrific opportunities for applying this technology. So these robots are related to unmanned aerial vehicles. However, the vehicles you see here are big. They weigh thousands of pounds and are not by any means agile. They're not even autonomous. In fact, many of these vehicles are operated by flight crews that can include multiple pilots, operators of sensors, and mission coordinators. What we're interested in is developing robots like this, and here are two other pictures of robots that you can buy off the shelf. So these are helicopters with four rotors, and they're roughly a meter or so in scale, and weigh several pounds. And so we retrofit these with sensors, and processors, and these robots can fly indoors without GPS. The robot I'm holding in my hand is this one, and it's been created by two students, Alex and Daniel. So this weighs a little more than a tenth of a pound. It contains about 15 watts of power, and as you can see, it's about eight inches in diameter. So let me give you just a very quick tutorial on how these robots work. So it has four rotors. If you spin these rotors at the same speed, the robot hovers. If you increase the speed of each of these rotors, then the robot flies up, it accelerates up. Of course, if the robot were tilted, inclined to the horizontal, then it would accelerate in this direction. So to get it to tilt, there's one of two ways of doing it. In this picture, you see that rotor four is spinning faster and rotor two is spinning slower. And so that happens, there's a moment that causes this robot to roll. And the other way around, if you increase the speed of rotor three and decrease the speed of rotor three, the robot pushes forward. And the way, if you spin opposite pair of rotors faster than the other pair, then the robot yaws about the vertical axis. So an onboard processor essentially looks at what motions need to be executed and combines these motions and figure out what commands to send to the motors 600 times a second. And that's basically how this thing operates. So one of the advantages of this design is when you scale things down, the robot naturally becomes agile. So here, R is the characteristic length of the robot. It's actually half the diameter. And there are lots of physical parameters that change as you reduce R. The one that's the most important is the inertia or the resistance to motion. So it turns out the inertia, which governs angular motion, scales as a fifth power of R. So the smaller you make R, the more dramatically the inertia reduces. So as a result, the angular acceleration, denoted by Greek letter alpha here, goes as one over R. It's inversely proportional to R. So the smaller you make it, the more quickly you can turn. So this should be clear in these videos. On the bottom right, you see a robot performing a 360-degree flip in less than half a second. Multiple flips, a little more time. So here, the processors on board are getting feedback from accelerometers and gyros on board and calculating, like I said before, command at 600 times a second to stabilize this robot. So on the left, you see Daniel throwing this robot up into the air. And it shows you how robust the control is. No matter how you throw it, the robot recovers and comes back to him. So why build robots like this? Well, robots like this have many applications. You can send them inside buildings like this as first responders to look for intruders, maybe look for biochemical leaks, gaseous leaks. You can also use them for applications like construction. the damage after natural disasters or sent into reactor buildings to map radiation levels. 
So one fundamental problem that the robots have to solve if they have to be autonomous is essentially figure out how to get from point A to point B. So this gets a little challenging because the dynamics of this robot are quite complicated. In fact, they live in a 12-dimensional space. So we use a little trick. We take this curved 12-dimensional space and transform it into a flat four-dimensional space. And that four-dimensional space consists of X, Y, Z, and then the yaw angle. And so what the robot does is it plans what we call a minimum snap trajectory. So to remind you of physics, you have position, derivative, velocity, then acceleration, and then comes jerk, and then comes snap. So this robot minimizes snap. So what that effectively does is produces a smooth and graceful motion. And it does that avoiding obstacles. So these minimum snap trajectories in this flat space are then transformed back into this complicated 12-dimensional space, which the robot must do for control and then execution. So let me show you some examples of what these minimum snap trajectories look like. And in the first video, you'll see the robot going from point A to point B through an intermediate point. So the robot is obviously capable of executing any curved trajectory. So these are circular trajectories where the robot holds about two Gs. Here you have overhead motion capture cameras on the top that tell the robot where it is 100 times a second. It also tells the robot where these obstacles are. And the obstacles can be moving. And here you'll see Daniel throw this hoop into the air. So the robot is calculating the position of the hoop and trying to figure out how to best go through the hoop. So as an academic, we're always trained to be able to jump through hoops to raise funding for our labs. And we get our robots to do that. So another thing the robot can do is it remembers pieces of trajectory that it learns or is pre-programmed. So here you see the robot combining a motion that builds up momentum and then changes its orientation and then recovers. So it has to do this because the gap in the window is only slightly larger than the width of the robot. So just like a diver stands on a springboard and then jumps off it to gain momentum, and then does this pirouette, this two and a half somersault, and then gracefully recovers. This robot is basically doing that. So it knows how to combine little bits and pieces of trajectories to do these fairly difficult tasks. So I want to change gears. So one of the disadvantages of these small robots is its size. And I told you earlier that we may want to employ lots and lots of robots to overcome the limitations of size. So one difficulty is how do you coordinate lots of these robots? And so here we look to nature. So I want to show you a clip of Phenogaster desert ants in Professor Stephen Pratt's lab carrying an object. So this is actually a piece of fig. Actually, you take any object coated with fig juice, and the ants will carry them back to the nest. So these ants don't have any central coordinator. They sense their neighbors. There's no explicit communication. But because they sense the neighbors and because they sense the object, they have implicit coordination across the group. So this is the kind of coordination we want our robots to have. So when we have a robot, which is surrounded by neighbors, and let's look at robot I and robot J, what we want the robots to do is to monitor the separation between them as they fly in formation. And then you want to make sure that this separation is within acceptable levels. So again, the robots monitor this error and calculate the control commands 100 times a second, which then translates to the motor commands 600 times a second. So this also has to be done in a decentralized way. Again, if you have lots and lots of robots, it's impossible to coordinate all this information centrally fast enough in order for the robots to accomplish the task. Plus, the robots have to base their actions only on local information, what they sense from their neighbors. And then finally, we insist that the robots be agnostic to who their neighbors are. So this is what we call anonymity. So what I want to show you next is a video of 20 of these little robots flying in formation. They're monitoring their neighbor's position. They're maintaining formation. The formations can change. They can be planar formations. They can be three-dimensional formations. 
As you can see here, they collapse from a three-dimensional formation into planar formation, and to fly through obstacles, they can adapt the formations in the, on the fly. So again, these robots come really close together, as you can see in this figure eight flight, they come within inches of each other. And despite the aerodynamic interactions with these propeller blades, they're able to maintain stable flight. So once you know how to fly in formation, you can actually pick up objects cooperatively. So this just shows that we can double, triple, quadruple the robot strength by just getting them to team with neighbors, as you can see here. One of the disadvantages of doing that is as you scale things up, so if you have lots of robots carrying the same thing, you're essentially effectively increasing the inertia, and therefore you pay a price. They're not as agile. But you do gain in terms of payload carrying capacity. Another applicant tells the robot what part to pick up, when, and where to place it. So in this video you see, and it's set up 10, 14 times, you see three different structures being built by these robots. And again, everything is autonomous, and all Quentin has to do is, what if there's no GPS? So this robot is actually equipped with a camera capture system. So what happens when you leave your lab and you go outside into the real world? And what if there's no GPS? So this robot is actually equipped with a camera and a laser range finder, laser scanner. And it uses these sensors to build a map of the environment. What that map consists of are features like doorways, windows, people, furniture, and it then figures out where its position is with respect to the features. So there is no global coordinate system. The coordinate system is defined based on the robot, where it is and what it's looking at. And it navigates with respect to those features. So I want to show you a clip with algorithms developed by Frank Shen and Professor Nathan Michael that shows this robot entering a building for the very first time and creating this map on the fly. So the robot then figures out what the features are, it builds the map, it figures out where it is with respect to the features, and then estimates this position 100 times a second, allowing us to use the control algorithms that I described to you earlier. So this robot is actually being commanded remotely by Frank, but the robot can also figure out where to go on its own. So suppose I were to send this into a building and I had no idea what this building looked like, I can ask this robot to go in, create a map, and then come back and tell me what the building looks like. So here, the robot is not only solving the problem how to go from point A to point B in this map, but it's figuring out what the best point B is at every time. So essentially, it knows where to go to look for places that have the least information, and that's how it populates this map. So I want to leave you with one last application, and there are many applications of this technology. I'm a professor, and we're passionate about education. Robots like this can really change the way we do K-12 through education. But we're in Southern California, close to Los Angeles, so I have to conclude with something focused on entertainment. I want to conclude with a music video. I want to introduce the creators, Alex and Daniel, who created this video. So before I play this video, I want to tell you that they created it in the last three days after getting a call from Chris. And the robots that play the video are completely autonomous. You will see nine robots play six different instruments and of course, it's made exclusively for TED 2012. Let's watch. Thank <laughs> you. 
this was a you know uh, the autonomous uh, unmanned flying robot which is uh, called as a drone quad capter as on today and uh, you are seeing you know extremely uh, complicated robots which will be assisting for you know flood relief operations then medical assistance and all the things and uh, you can see here in some of the uh, things like uh, i was associated with uh, uh, one uh, professor ss anger of uh, louisiana state university who developed for after uh, 20 years of research a robot called as agbo louisiana state university's department of computer science and robotics research laboratory present intelligence cutting edge wireless communication and advanced mechanical engineering combined together to create a marvelous entity called the Agbot. multi-purpose agricultural log cleaning and uh, glass cutting, fertilizing, robot. Picture this, a healthy green lawn which is perfect for lounging, great for ball games and cookouts, and a real asset to your home. Caring for your lawn properly can both enhance its appearance and contribute to its environmental benefits. This means creating conditions for caring for your lawn in an environmentally sensible way can have a bigger impact than you might think. Your lawn is only a small piece of land, but all the lawns across the country cover a lot of ground. That means you and your lawn care activities, along with everyone else's, can make a difference in the environment. And that's why taking care of the environment begins in our own backyard. Is actually the mechanism which will be there. The Agbot uses a four-wheel drive mechanism and a high torque motor which facilitates a high load carrying capacity and a good speed of six miles per hour. It carries a 10-gallon fertilizer tank which is more than sufficient for a medium-sized backyard. The attached solar panel provides so much juice that the Agbot can work for a minimum of four hours. The steel distribution system spreads the fertilizer evenly so that the chemicals do not brown out the grass. Also, the gate of the fertilizer tank can be adjusted accordingly using a remote control. Actually, this is a manual method which you use. With like the manual this. system, there are possibilities of ruining a lawn by over-fertilizing it, as excess fertilizer leads to excess pass to a fertilizer deposition. If you're looking for a way to energize your tired lawn and give it a golf course quality look, but want to save time and money, look no further. You have found the answer. The AdBot uses advanced GPS technology to map itself to its surroundings. Once the coordinates of the lawn are fed into the AgBot, they are permanent and will be erased only if needed. The AgBot navigates accurately and effortlessly using the inbuilt GPS system. The AgBot will fertilize the lawn on your preset time and date. Also, it uses ultrasonic object detection technology to avoid objects in front of it thereby preventing any damage to itself, advanced artificial intelligence will be reduced or increased effectively. The AgBot is the new revolutionary way to maintain your lawn and keep it healthy and green. The 
they needed repeated shuffle. Headbot is equipped with sophisticated patented technology, which includes a seat hopper with a powerful automatic auger system. The auger system is equipped by the user. Due to its rigid body and powerful four-wheel drive configuration, directly, or use the easy-to-operate remote control to direct the Agbot while you enjoy the cool revolutionize the field of robotics and the answer is yes software it will immediately set off a loud alarm and in the process take a snapshot of the intruder yeah this was a you know a robot which was developed by Louisiana State University and uh, it was a hard effort of you know 20 batches of students and finally it is a multi-purpose you know agricultural uh, lawn cleaning and uh, it acts as a night watchman also, and uh, commercially it is available now, patented, and it's uh, available for about $2,000 now. So that is the kind of robot they have, and uh, you have a uh, number of robots in the industries also, which might look like this. I'll just show you. Uh, this is a cooperative robot which I uh, gave you. Uh, then uh, this is... The same thing, I don't know. Uh, let us get into the main topic. Uh, what exactly is a robot going to look like? If you start seeing uh, the, the growth of robotics is always going to give an indication of the technology uh, of any country. And you can see the sales of robotic units as of today is uh, going explosive. Actually, if you carefully observe this graph, it's going to give the milestone of technological developments it is 1956, NC machines started coming 1970, computers, first generation, second generation, third generation, there is a steady growth and a lot of technologies like digital signal processing, then image processing, then object identification, everything started coming. But what happened? Because of, you know, year 2000 problem, Y2K problem, the scientists in the world, they had a lot of problems and the, the, uh, there was a slump in the robotics growth and it all of a sudden you know started coming down it, it, to the fact that you know people started thinking that robots are going to have a kind of uh, uh, this uh, manipulation due to you know the uh, the energy problems or the electric short circuiting etc in the industries and they they are of the opinion that the robots which were very used to you know play with the kids they started hitting the kids and they started, you know, slapping the workers in the uh, this thing uh, in the industries, and the the image of the robotics started going down because of the mismatch of various technological fields. Then afterwards, you know, the internet coming here, and from 2004 onwards, there is a steady growth, and it started going like anything. And you are <coughs> now we are in the industry 4.0 and 5.0 that we are seeing and you can see that you know 2010-20 this is uh, the evolution of industry 4.0 where internet of things cyber physical systems started coming up and uh, 2020 you can see that it's it's onset of you know fifth industrial revolution that is nothing but industry 5.0 where personalization of the things are going to happen and robots are going to you know go hand in hand with the human beings and they work together and the the kind of you know artificial intelligence expert systems and the match of all the integrated technology can be seen here now let me come to the robotic definitions this is a structure of a common industrial robot a robot will always have three you know things information about the task energy source workspace once that is fed the computer will start you know organizing instructions and it will pass it on to the operational unit and the action is going to be performed and the measurements are going to be done. It's an open loop here in the external thing. So if you want to make an, uh, you know, external sensors as, you know, a closed loop, then the cost of the robot is going to be very high, which you can see here in as a structure of a sophisticated high tech robot, which is going to have same thing, three things, information about task, energy source, and the external workspace, it will be there. And task comes here. There will be the computer control algorithms, task programming, model of the robot, model of the environment, everything will be there and entire thing starts working and depending upon the, you know, work which is needed here, 
the control commands or getting into the articulated mechanical systems and actuators starts working and the robot starts you know performing the action and transmission systems will be there first of all in any case the robot if it is going to be a closed loop that means if it is going to have a two way communication and it will have corrections on its own the cost of the robot is going to be very high that you can see some of the you know probably a uh, number of uh, the uh, famous robots started coming due to the movies a lot of movies were the inspirations i showed you in the beginning the movie of you know uh, the i robot where you had lots of clippings same thing started coming in star wars and the sony's ibo robot a robotic dog that learns through human interactions asimo all these things let us get into one by one how they are going to be let's take a, a clipping of these robots and this of course is a nasa's robonaut where what happens is the human hand was very very difficult robot cooperative manipulated robot which was you know developed and it took nearly took nearly 5 years to develop this kind of astronaut and uh, the robonaut was one of a very very sophisticated robot we started flying on its own and what happens is if you are going to have robots going on different terrains you can see that if it is going to be a biped there is going to be a problem of instability and all the things you know you, you which you saw there the falling mechanism if a robot falls it will not be able to get up by itself and lot of dynamics will be involved there now if you start thinking about you know basic robot anatomy there is going to be an operational unit there is going to be a cpu there is going to be sensor operational unit is going to contain a manipulator which is nothing but a mechanical arm and uh, the mechanical arm will have number of joints and too many joints is going to have a poor maneuverability and the actuators will also be there so in moving the ligaments and uh, they start working on uh, the three types of actuators basically exist electric hydraulic pneumatic and other things are also going to be there they are going to be stepper controlled or servo controlled open loop or closed loop then transmission systems will be there and like that and robots classification was also done based on sophistication first generation robots the program robots up to 1997 77 and uh, there simply instructions are going to be fed in an open loop manner and there won't be any feedback sensor and up to 97 uh, 77 these robots were called program robots and second generation up to 86 they had a kind of vision then the uh, uh, the uh, sensors which will be there for observing the environment and after 86 the development of third generation robots started coming and intelligent robots with self learning capacity started coming based on control types you can classify the robots non servo robots servo controlled then types of motion speak and place point to point movement and continuous path and general purpose robots special purpose pnp then based on mechanical arm geometry cartesian robots cylindrical robots polar jointed on like that which you can see here the configurations and the the, the present day world population was this was a uh, you know census which was done in 2000 now the count of the robot is innumerable and it cannot be done as on today and the most popular robot here during that time has been you know cylindrical which will be used for assembly operations this was a cartesian robot which will be heavy sturdy very accurate and uh, as you go on making you know joints you know rotating then the maintenance is going to be easier but the accuracy is going to be lost which you can see here some of the modern robots i want to show and there is a man called as tildon who was called as father of the modern world and he started developing you know insect robots and they were called as photo wars which you are seeing here and what happened is he he started you know he was a school dropout he started a in san diego desert a fun school for you know american kids they started going there they started working on many robots and lot of you know robots started coming up out of the discarded electronic parts in america then if you are going to see a robot working on a master slave concept there is a robot called a sarcos which starts playing a table tennis and there is a master and this master will have a gadget and once there is a gadget once the master you know hits a ball and the ball you know bounces on the table every information is going to go through this gadget to the sarcos robot and it starts learning all the actions 
and this this the sarcos finally the scientists were able to you know uh, succeed in making sarcos defeat its own master this kind of robots were also available then this is a robot which uh, you are saying that most complicated you know the femoral bone operation orthopedic surgery is going to be done and this is a, a robot doc which exists in pittsburgh hospital in us and it does help you know the doctors in many way for precision drilling and implantation of the femoral bones which you are seeing here and this is an rb autonomous robot which can be used just like you know the bulldozer kind of things or uh, the the patent tank which will have these kind of motions which can move on any terrain and climbing up stairs and it's not a problem and it goes heavily and you can see that this is an it robot which will be used by the police department which will be kept on the you know uh, table and in front of the criminal and it starts observing all the emotional uh, uh, you know uh, facial expressions and the lip and the eyebrow motions of the culprit and it starts diagnosing and finding out whether the uh, criminal is lying or uh, uh, a fact so this will be used by police department this is going to be a robot called a cipher which is going to be a hovercraft robot which can be used for you know flood relief operations to drop food packets from 50 miles to an accuracy of 3 inch or 4 inch on the earth and it was used for flood relief operations also this is a robot which we are seeing here that it is imitation of the you know insects here cockroach which is an omnivorous on that back of that there is a gadget which was kept and uh, the entire cockroach starts moving throughout the day and starts you know recording all the information and motions of the cockroach and if you make a you know mechanism which is going to have the same you know uh, uh, the the uh, the articulations as that of a, a cockroach then if you start putting the gadget on that play that then it starts behaving like a robot and you can see that here the welding robot uh, lots of flights of robots in honda uh, motor company wherein you know at least 12 to 16 you know welding robots pounds upon a car body if you can start thinking about you know ambassador car which was manufactured by hindustan river company there earlier hindustan motors it used to take one month for the production of single car whereas the entire car body here is going to be welded smartly and the production of the plant was nearly you know 20 minutes a car in that this is a creepy crawlers which will be used just like you know spider motions by japanese oil tanks huge tanks they will be kept kept on the oil tanks 24/7 they will be you know vigiling the entire you know uh, the gas tanks for the leakages these robots will have welding equipment on the back of that and whenever there is going to be a smell sensor and the leakage which is going to be diagnosed it starts you know taking out its uh, uh, spot welding kit and starts repairing that and starts moving all the 24 hours and you can see that you know big uh, uh, the the um, multi story buildings in america which may be more than you know 100 uh, stories in japan they're going to be use these kind of you know vacuum creeper gripper robots which can start you know working throughout the day and start cleaning the window panes which is an extremely difficult operation there is an insert there is going to be a 1 inch worm robot which is called as a denso which starts moving autonomously inside the capillaries which was used by so many uh, things like you know putting autonomously a robot in case of a blood vein which will start cleaning the coronary uh, clottings in the human veins and this is an insert of a uh, the, the steel spielberg the the famous director who starts using you know robot for its dinosaur of the mother robot which you can see here and the mechanism has is seen like that there can be robots which can be undersea robots which will be there and this is a most successful robot which you know became defunct recently this is mars pathfinder it is it is a six leg robot which uh, you know worked almost uh, more than 14 years and uh, recently it came down to hard what it used to do was every time the mars pathfinder used to move on the mars earth surface and moving 40 miles every day taking the samples of the earth and then sending the photographs to the nasa and working on that this is a tesla robot which works on uh, the high voltage conditions it is made of uh, titanium 
thing and it can withstand a temperature of 2400 degrees and the same kind of robots were also used for you know studying the volcanic eruptions in alaska rims and the robots that time were called as dante robots i will not be talking about the you know, micro nano robots these are also you know the advancements in the, the robotic technology we are going to call a micro robot when there is going to be the accuracy which will be involved in a micro robot the handling operation is going to be a micro precision and you can see that number of robots which are uh, there uh, will, will start working and uh, you can see some of them like you know darpa defense of american research project agency they started developing number of uh, the insect robots and they started imitating insect activities and this is a flying micro robots snake like robot and all these things you can start seeing here these are the robots this is inchworm robot what it does is it, it has an internal energy motor here once it has a vacuum gripper here the other uh, free end starts moving and it will have locomotive no, 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 nature and it starts moving this is a flyer micro robot which was used for you know uh, relaying tv programs and the exploration on other planets and this is snake like you know micro robots which will be having you know number of motors which are connected in modular and the entire body is going to crawl like and they will have uh, you can say n number of degrees of freedom and starts moving through the terrain and this is a cricket micro robot which starts having and you must be knowing that in you know, ants have a huge uh, carrying capacity of load and they carry capacity more than 50 times their own weight and that has been that property has been used and uh, you must be uh, seeing you know the chandrayana uh, 3 they are going to use a nano robot and these are going to be uh, looking like uh, underwater sea robots and uh, number of areas where micro robots are going to be deployed is going to be medical technology bioengineering metrology production engineering household applications micro assembly and all this will be there then biomimetic robots these are the examples which are already there this was an a robot explorer which can be put on you know the rover a small rover a nano rover which will be placed on the mars surface and these are you know the ants this was i was telling about ants having you know 50 times uh, carrying capacity as that the scientists are really finding out what kind of material has to be used for the legs so that the ant is going to bear out that particular uh, you know the load and carry that very effectively and you have number of robots coming here uh, which are used in tyro robotics but what is important in case of uh, nano robot is that it's a flexible system which is totally automated manipulator and will be able to handle objects with micrometer size but it will have a nanometer uh, precision so resolution is going to be something like you know in a, a small volume of 1 cm cube then 10 nanometer will be the accuracy which starts it moving so this is a nano robotic system which has number of controllers and uh, the devices which you can see here and it will be centrally controlled and starts working and nano robots are the plenty in nature industrial medical medical fields and research they are going to be used for plenty of applications this is the nano rover which can be used for exploration activities where they will have no problems of landing and other things which you know we faced in chandrayaan 2 uh, you can see here the nano robot which adapts itself automatically self program robots they do not execute commands which lead to obstructions then this is a hexa pad which was used by space robotics where you can keep the you know robots and nano robots for experimentation purpose and uh, satellite antenna control is one of them providing you know all 6 degrees of freedom it can have hexa pad or quarter pad and uh, all these motions will be controlled then you can have a demanded uh, uh, nano robot which can be used for nano medicines and scientists have come out with nano robots which can be injectable form or it can be a, in the form of a cream which can be put on these uh, mechanisms and you will find out lot of things are going to happen hello ah uh, so i I'll, i'll i'll conclude now i'll i'll come to the conclusion session robots can also be used in dental surgeries filling tooth gaps that they can be used for removing clots from the surgery and all these things we are seeing here and the the best examples of robots you know submarine robots are nothing but the bacteria 
and the virus which can be imitated so i am not getting into the you know future uh, things now and whatever may be many unsolved problems are going to exist and 2250 the robots are going to have you know consciousness artificial personality everything and there is going to be a few thing and all the robots are going to come in these areas child care military socially uh, the existing all this i think i'll have to close my lecture because of the inauguration central inauguration which is going to go in gujarat technological university and so i'll be uh, doing it again for the valedictory uh, later on with the advancements in the robots thanks a lot for the organizers and thanks for your patience here thank you thank you mohan sir yeah. so we sincerely thank you for accepting our invitation to be a resource person yeah. we are extremely sorry yeah. that uh, we missed your introduction to the participants so mohan kumar sir was the former principal and government uh, principal uh, in the government uh, engineering college hasan and stm darwad he also served as professor at mc hasan sir we thank you on behalf of government polytechnic harpalli for uh, providing a very insightful inaugural talk on robotics so in the shortage of time also you have given a lot of information uh, regarding the introduction of robotics so it will is a very helpful session i hope so i request uh, all participants uh, now that uh, uh, to attend the central inauguration ceremony online from aict headquarters in association with gujarat university i already shared the link of that one in the whatsapp group so you may all join in facebook live regarding that one and uh, mohan kumar sir also i have another last session of this fdp uh, that is session 14 on a friday evening so in that day we will uh, yeah, definitely give the um, uh, guest in a uh, guest uh, introduction uh, everything once again and uh, the uh, since uh, sir has a lot of information so that day it will take around 2 to 2.5 hours also so since there are a lot of resources uh, with them so they are presenting all the things on that day so thank you very much sir mohan sir for your uh, valuable time to yes. spend with us thank okay. you a lot of you know hurry busy thing happened only because of you know shortage of time and yes the, sir yes sir which has which happened are you there in bsnl uh, uh, now is no sir still it is uh, not working sir no problem we are uh, worked with oh, mobile so oh, within oh, afternoon it will get come back sir okay yes. so yes. thank you uh, participants please all of you log out and uh, get joined to the facebook live uh, uh, of inaugural session of uh, central inauguration session okay so thank okay. you thank you all thank you sir thank you thank you sir our next session will be at 2:30 i think but all alumni sir